Mabuhay. Greetings from the Philippines, specifically here from Baliwag University. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who are here. Welcome to the sixth and last session of the Shaping Sustainable Futures Together webinar series. I am Cristel Marie Ponsalan, the Director of Center for Research at Baliwag University of Philippines, your moderator for today's webinar. As I mentioned earlier, we have come to the last session of this webinar series. It started last year in November and every month there, thereafter, the session was conducted every third Friday of the month. With the exception of this last session, since the third Friday falls on a religious holiday which is observed here in the Philippines. Anyway, it is nice to see again everyone who have participated in all or in some of the sessions. The series is brought to us by Baliwag University in cooperation with University College of Estate Management, Global Sustainable Futures Network, the OPEDUCA Project, and Maastricht University in the Netherlands. This session is bittersweet. Bitter as this marks the end or the last of the six fruitful sessions, but also sweet as it culminates and signifies the success of an informative series that comprehensively covered the topics on introduction to sustainability, systems thinking, and problem analysis, the meaning and impact of the SDG, and sustainable leadership, and global sustainability and corporate social responsibility. The theme for today is leading sustainable transformation. Before we proceed, let me remind everyone of our webinar guidelines. First, kindly use your complete name and name of affiliation as your Zoom account name. Second, please keep yourself on mute. And third, if you have a question, you may type it in the chat box and share your ideas. Also, here are some, of, some reminders and details of your participation to this webinar series. Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series is comprised of six online events or short workshop events, which were held every month from November 2021 to April 2022. At the end of the six online events, each participant will receive certificate of participation in Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series. Evaluation of the activity will be done before ending the program. It is truly a delight to see all our participants from various parts of the world. No differences in time zones, language, culture, background can stop bringing people together for a common goal of working for a sustainable future. At this moment, to formally welcome us all to this virtual engagement, let us have the president of the Baliwag University, Dr. Patricia Bustos Lagunda. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Board of Trustees and the Administration of the Baliwag University in Philippines, let me extend my warm virtual welcome to all of you. We are now on the sixth and last session of this series, Shaping for Sustainable Futures Together, as brought to us by the University College of Estate Management, Global Sustainable Futures Network, the OPEDUCA Project, Maastricht University in Netherlands, and Baliwag University. The previous sessions have provided us with comprehensive inputs on introduction to sustainability, systems thinking and problem analysis, the meaning and impact of the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs, sustainability leadership, global sustainability, and corporate social responsibility. Today, we shall have another relevant topic on sustainability, which is sustainable transformation. For the past five months, this series has been presented by multidisciplinary alliance of scholars and practitioners, our delivery team. In addition, our, web our webinar series has been attended by participants from various societal sectors involving scholars, university students, school leaders, governmental policy developers, managers from mid-scale and larger industry, as well as NGOs. Baliwag University's visiting fellows for global sustainability will surely provide all of us 
with action-based perspectives for today's topic on sustainable transformation. Future thinking organizations need to align our strategies towards sustainable transformation, becoming environmentally, socially, and economically sustainable needs consistent change along the 17 interconnected sustainable development goals. Sustainable transformation is a tough and challenging concern, but with our increasing awareness on sustainability and our commitment to contribute to improve the quality of life of the future generations, we can gradually realize sustainable transformation. My hope is that this last session is not the end of our journey towards sustainable futures, but the beginning of our deliberate efforts of action to contribute toward the 17 SDGs. Oliwag University is very open to sustaining this collaboration to spread the advocacy of sustainable development. Let me thank our visiting fellows for global sustainability, Dr. Renuka Takor, Dr. Joss Osen, and Mr. Ku Hok Aung for their invaluable insights and perspectives for the past six months. And also to our Philippine team, Dr. Francia Santos and BU's Mr. Rain Reina Flor Castro, or Bubbles as we call her, for their excellent support in the success of this seminar series. I hope that we can continue to work together towards a sustainable future. In closing, I wish all of us a productive and meaningful webinar on leading sustainable transformation. Thank you very much and stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Lagunda. And indeed, the, uh, this is not the end of, this may be the end of the webinar series, but I'm sure this is just the beginning of some proactive initiatives towards sustainable futures. At this juncture, let me give the virtual floor to Dr. Francia R. Santos, the Philippine Coordinator of Global Sustainable Futures and faculty member, RVRCOB of De La Salle University, Manila, to introduce the BU Visiting Fellows from Global Sustainability and members of the delivery team. Thank you very much, Dr. Patricia Lagunda and uh, Ms. Christelle. So today is a blessed day as we are privileged again to learn from the Visiting Fellows for Global Sustainability. So I am really honored to introduce the delivery team for this last session of the Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series, uh, focusing on leading sustainable transformation. The first um, member of the SSFTS, so is our team lead from University College Estate of Management UK and founder of the Global Sustainable Futures Network progress through partnership network. So the global sustainability influencer, Dr. Renuka Thakor. Next member of the team is a lecturer of sustainable development and climate change from Maastricht University, Netherlands. So he is globally influential um, as a sustainability educator. Let's welcome Professor Dr. Joss Yusen. And of course, last but not the least, is a convener for Global Sustainability Summits and Dialogues, Global and ASEAN Green Chamber of Commerce uh, from Malaysia. So he is also equally influential sustainability educator, Professor Ku Hak On. So grateful for the valuable time and incredible knowledge of our visiting fellows for global sustainability for sharing their expertise on how to shape sustainable futures together. So let's all enjoy this uh, together series and um, gain relevant key takeaways from the Baliwag University visiting fellows for global sustainability, Dr. Renuka Thakor, Professor Dr. Joseph. Yusen and Professor Kuhak on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Francia. Let us head on to the lecture sessions on the topic leading sustainable transformation from our visiting fellows. 
may I now give the spotlight to the members of the delivery team. They will entertain your questions during the open forum of our program. Shall I start? Yes, Dr. Takor, you may now start with Thank your you. presentation. Thank you. And you can see my slide? Yes, it's now visible. Okay. And and is it a slideshow? Yeah, yes, I think it's in full screen. Yeah, thank you. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone here. I'm really, really very pleased today, very excited to see this series to the end successfully. And as Dr. Patricia mentioned, the starting of our brainstorming for the sustainable futures. So you take away and brainstorm yourself and put it into concrete actions. And I'm very, very thankful to Belugia organizing team, Dr. Patricia Laguna and Dr. Francia Santos, Kuhu Kehoen, and Professor Jos Hussein, who is the, also part of the delivery team. Extremely grateful to all of you. And I'm also thankful to the organizations who have provided in kind support for this workshop series. I would also say, just to uh, highlight us uh, intention of this series uh, when we started, my intention was to just uh, build a capacity in Belugua University for sustainability discourse. And I think we have achieved at some point, at some extent. And I'm very glad that they will be taking up this journey further. And uh, uh, I would also like to share a few updates here before I go into the main uh, discussion that we will be producing this series as part of our book. And uh, we are in process of that. Uh, if anyone is interested in putting their reviews or any, any extra, um, um, writing, they are welcome to uh, contact me and we will consider them to see how we can include them in this book. Secondly, I would like to announce as part of our GSFN uh, network that we have started AI and Python series that is also for free online. So if you wish to join that, I will put a post in the chat later on so you can register and uh, start. Only four or five sessions have finished, but they, it is never late to start anything. Uh, another I would like to uh, announce that we have collaborated with uh, global ambassadors of uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, development and uh, global ambassador of sustainability. And they are providing uh, free, uh, free uh, training for sustainability leadership. And you can take that chance because it is free and online. Uh, so that also, I will put a link here. And you can, uh, and if you are not able to go through the link, you can contact me and I will put through you. And so there is a chance to learn more become more professional in your the sustainability credentials. So feel free to take, grab these opportunities. And also just a, a final announcement that uh, we invite people to talk about their work, talk about their experiences. Every, uh, we have a monthly seminars, which is on second and third Fridays through GSFN, which, are, which is on uh, live on YouTube and also we have a TV channel. I'm really proud to say that that our uh, t 
TV channel is the first sustainability channel in the world, free for everyone to view. So uh, please come on board if you have something to share with us. So stopping there, I will start this main presentation today, leading sustainable transformation. And today we are going to just recap what we already mentioned, highlighting few steps that are really important for you to carry on becoming or leading your sustainable transformation. Why I'm saying your, because it is an individual's responsibility as part of individual, and you are part of a collective group, any, any group it may be business, it may be community, it may be your family. And uh, so I would say that the two parts you have to play, two roles you have to play, play individual and collective. And that's why uh, it is important that you understand both roles and uh, uh, go forward with your sustainability journey or transformational journey. So of course we know that climate change is real and serious. It is the latest report on IPCC special report, global warming of 1.5 degree report has confirmed and it has also confirmed that we need all urgent actions. And it is not 2030, it is 2025. We need to achieve our targets by 2025. And therefore we all, all need to uh, contribute to achieving this. And there are things uh, such as anthrop Anthropocene, and these all also establish that it is the man-made activities who have that have contributed to this climate change. And therefore we need to be uh, concerned that it is our activities that are contributing to this problem. So uh, everyone needs to act. It also means that we have consumed, uh, we have increased our consumption of natural resources and in turn, it releases a lot of carbon emissions and we need to control or we need to absorb those carbon emissions back into the uh, atmosphere in a way that it does not remain dangerous to the mankind it does not impact adversely on the nature. And therefore we need to control the emissions of carbon, uh, carbon emissions. And there are several ways where we can trap. You have seen in the previous uh, sessions that we have shown you the strategies to trap. And that is very important if we want to move our uh, transformations, we need to focus on carbon, neutrality or carbon trapping or net zero. These are the um, uh, concepts we need to keep in our mind that where we are going, they are need to be our ultimate goals, net zero. And of course, there are various other problems due to this climate change, such as uh, co coral bleaching, which is the biggest problem at the moment around 99% of coral will be diminished by 2050. So we need to take care of that. Of course, there is a sea level rise, the uh, um, ice, a melting of ice, and also a concentration of CO2 and the ocean acidif acidification. There are several other aspects like this, which we need to take care of while we are continuing doing our businesses as usual, sorry, not as usual, uh, doing businesses, but not as usual in a sense that we are not impacting adversely on these things. Also, we have spoken that uh, we need to increase renewable resources. And there is definitely there is an increase but we have to think how we individually can contribute to these renewable resources, how we can uh, stop using uh, our 
um, non-renewable resources or we, how we can stop fossil fuel. So this, as well as along with that, we have to think how we can uh, make our society more acceptable to everyone in the sense of or inclusive and accessible, uh, how we can include, uh, become more gender neutral um, and many other uh, uh, drawbacks which we have. Um, I, I may not be able to cover everything here, but certainly we are looking to have women gender equality, which is the um, uh, quite a, a big issue if we are not including women as as 50 50 in our society then we are losing out several things that is also an economic uh, case for that however i'm not going into details but we need to make sure that every organization or every family has an equal voice of women finally uh, yes we, I would like to stress that we do not have planet B or plan B. And therefore we need to make sure that we have our planet as healthy as possible. So having said that, we have also looked through the series that there are uh, the concept of sustainable development was born, but however, it has grown immensely with uh, several other uh, concepts built within it, which is like uh, people, prosperity, peace, partnership, and planet. It also uh, went through the series of uh, discussion from Kuwaiti Protocol, sustainable production and cons uh, consumption, responsible sourcing, and then we came to uh, Millennium Development Goals, and then Finally, we also have now sustainable development goals, uh, 17 sustainable development goals. And though these are the concepts which has helped us to shape what we need in future, and of course we haven't achieved most of the goals, but they are the drivers. They have shown us the pathways to move forward. And therefore they should remain in our decision making. We should think how we are going to achieve them. Are we contributing them at least to an extent? It may not be big, or, uh, big enough to reach the target, but collectively we can do it. And we have to be that enthusiastic and motivational towards this, achieving this. So there are several, several concepts. You can take any one of the concept and try yourself to move forward. Also technology is going to play a biggest role in transformation. And innovations are occurring everywhere. Every minute there is an innovation. However, these innovations, because they are new and not tested, are sometimes or, or, or wasted, but they contribute to your knowledge, what is failing and what is successful. And therefore we should encourage innovation. We should encourage technologies, but we have to make sure that these technologies do not put stress on our jobs, skills, and other things which we already have and which, which are already sustainable. And therefore we have to be mindful of which technology we want to go ahead. And certainly there is the way we move will be for the clean technology, the clean space we need to create through these technologies. And that is what this multi-level uh, figure which I'm showing is highlighting that market will accept only those technologies which are aligned for the mainstream, which are, uh, which can be diffused into mainstream. So whatever you are doing, 
think of innovative way how you will be able to diffuse it and whether it is useful for the mass of the people. When we are talking about mass of the people, do not think that you only market is economic market. That is, you will get uh, buy-in by the mass of the people because it is cheap or because you are able to sell. You have to think whether it is going to make any in adverse impact on nature, adverse impact on social society, and whether they, it is going to benefit all three pillars, social, environmental, and economic pillars of sustainability. Also, while you are doing this, you will have to be very, very competitive. You have to use your rules and your governing rules should be again aligned to those sustainable development goals or any concept of sustainability which you have adopted. Of course, mainly when it comes to businesses and your personal, we generally uh, try to align our goals to economic sustainability, but that is not the main, uh, main interest here. We need to again think of bottom line. And there will be our external pressures like regulations. So another theme, regulations will play a very big role. Regulations, including policies and uh, amendments to anything. And these regulations, for example, it is policy as well. So it could be your own policy that will allow you to take actions. So try to uh, build in these policies within your actions, and then you perform your uh, business activities or your lifestyle activities. Thirdly, st uh, smart cities. Here, the concept is only smart cities or sustainable cities. But what does it mean that it is allowing the acceptance of technology, urbanization, and natural resources, like everyone is accepted. And what is here emphasized that you should not be competing with the nature. You should not, you should be complementary to the nature along with your development. And that is very important here because of increased population, increased urbanization and increased sophisticated lifestyle. We want to achieve this, which is very, very um, extremely hard to achieve unless we all contribute to it. And when you go for sustainable development or, or, or transformation, and if you think as a project or, or a business activity, or any, I think for even if, if we take the example of this series, we need five building blocks. They are very, very important. And they are investment, information, initiative, innovation and incentives. And how you bring all these five driving elements into your projects try to analyze your projects or activities within this, that what I'm investing, how I'm innovating, uh, what is the in, uh, incentive around here? If you are able to capture these five elements, I think you will be able to facilitate that project towards sustainable transformation. Just as, as I have explained here that initially, for example, let us say we have these all yellow boxes already there. We have to extend ourselves to think about these such green complementaries that how we can bring the green credentials within our project. And that is what here I'm emphasizing that everything is existing. We don't want to have a radical change that might be disturbed. Of course, there are dis destructive uh, uh, technologies out there 
but we also want to not disturb the whole mass. We want to move the whole mass towards sustainable pathways. And therefore think of the complementaries that you can extend and bring into the, your societal system so that you can move the whole mass together. And there are several things like these about low carbon activities, which you can do in this way, the, uh, as I mentioned in the previous way, why not change the mode of transport? Why not change the mode of how we waste and how we recover waste? How can we change in the buildings where we live? How we can make them green? How we can make them low carbon? And again, how we you, uh, generate our energy. There are, uh, we are fortunate to have renewable sources with us, like wind, solar, and so on. So how we can move to generating energy from there. And of course, all the activities you do, try to make it net zero. I won't go into such details too much because we have already covered, but certainly I feel that changing our governing rules, for example, a small rule I have with myself that I won't buy virgin clothes. And it, it ha I have been successful in that. I have been able to buy clothes that have not been used by others. And I have no problem at all. I don't say that everyone should do that, but think what you can do. Think what you can lessen, how you can lessen the waste. How can you lessen the use of virgin natural resources and try to inbuild your activities within that. And these are the few examples which I have already uh, tested in different societal systems. And I think they work very well. And what is highlighted in this, that you have to take your own ownership, own leadership, leadership as an individual, but you are part of a group, part of an organization, part of a society, part of a community. And therefore you must play a role of leadership within that community or uh, group. But it should be aligned with what others do and it may not be the most successful, but if you are able to do some success, then share that story to others so that others can learn with you. Everyone should be not in competition. Stop competition because competition has either win or lose. And so only one wins. But if we are complementaries, everyone wins. And that is the main message for sustainable transformation. And of course, with CSR, so those who are in business have this corporate social responsibility. But those who are not in business, for example, me, individual, it's, it applies me as well. Because any carbon emissions have three dimensions, scope one, scope two, scope three. Scope one, which is directly I can control my activities. Scope two, which I receive and uh, from outside, but they are controllable by myself. For example, the energy which I receive from, uh, from outside, but I can control the energy I use at my home. I can switch off my lights if I want. I can use less light if I want. I can use less gas if, if I want. So these are the things which I can control, but I cannot control. When I go to buy a sh a clothes, I cannot control from where they have sourced the raw material of that cloth or where they have manufactured that cloth. And that is very, very difficult. And there I want you to become a researcher, an active participant in your supply chain and try to understand where your clothes have been manufactured, how they are manufactured, what raw material has been used, and try to be researcher. 
try to be a practitioner yourself of a sustainable transformation. And here for, for uh, businesses, we have ISO standards like this ISO 26000. This is just an example, but we have several standards to help you uh, move to a better practices. It is all about best practices. And if you want to acquire best, best practices, you have to become a practitioner, you have to become a, a researcher, and you also have to become a preacher in the sense an advocator if, because you need to buy in others for your own practices. And therefore I would say there are several roles you have to play when you have to do a sustainable transformation. And so collectively, I think these are different uh, things where you have to think about your environment. Are you doing any uh, harm to your environment? Are you okay with the labor and human rights which you have acquired through the supply chain, like you have uh, hired through the supply chain. You must also think about ethics, whether there was a corruption anywhere, whether there were anti-competitive practices anywhere. If you are aware, then at least do not take part in it. At least you raise voice against it. These are important. And finally, procurement, we procure every day in our everyday lifestyle, life, starting from food, living and everything. So try to understand where are you procuring, how you are procuring and so on. Think before you buy. And finally, I have these questions which I will come to back to these questions after we all three of us speak. Thank you very much for listening to me today. Thank you. We will now proceed with the presentation of Dr. Yusen. So you may now do your presentation, sir. Thank you. All right, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. You have my uh, first slide in view, I hope. Yes, sir. It's now visible okay. and you're loud and clear as well. Okay, excellent, thank you very much. Again, welcome uh, for everybody listening in, viewing in. I hope we can finalize this wonderful session uh, with, a, with a good debate. And I would like to see if I can trigger some questions and ideas. Uh, following everything Dr. Renuka already pointed out again to us, I think we are absolutely challenged to move ahead with sustainable development in different ways. The urge is magnificent and we are kind of lagging behind altogether. I'm afraid we have obsolete power structures in place and we need to switch to more active and involved citizenship without being told what to do ahead. Actually, if we want to make this world and society more sustainable, of course, we all know what to do. We don't have to question or research that any longer. We'll point it out later. We will have to exchange the power mechanisms we obey to momentarily. And perhaps we even have to let go, or most of all have to let go, of foolish ideas like people, planet, profit, and balancing these. I would even like to dare to question the SDGs, because also that framework makes us lose precious time. I think we need a logical perspective that offers us guidance, a more collective vision, something we can hold on and cling to together. And there are two essential elements of that collective vision that is a decrease in consumption and another learning scheme for our next generation. We lost two already since the Club of Rome pointed out the misery we are in now. That was 50 years ago, ladies and gentlemen. We could have had two generations ruling this world in a different way. And of course, science is not absolute. We, we, 
we know a lot, we don't know it all. We don't have a clue how the world functions in smallest details. We don't have a clue yet how the bigger picture is put together. But what we do know is that sustainable development is absolutely not complex. We're just making it complex. And I think that's one of the key messages I want to share with you today. We all want to live in, in, in wonderful nature. We want to breathe fresh air and enjoy drinkable water. And so later since the 1990s, we know how to recycle. We could recycle a Volkswagen already way before 1990. And of course, we know how to deal with rubbish and waste uh, to make, uh, for example, toilet paper out of drinking carbons. That's not a problem. We have the technology, we have the production facilities to do so, yet something blocks us from doing that. And all we all know from all different cultures and regions and tastes and what to eat, what is good and what not. So it's rather silly, isn't it? that we're still puzzled how to make this world more sustainable. It feels as if there's something between society and higher level policy, as if our mechanism, our system is cluttered with ideas and interests on which we try to put sustainable development as an additional predecur. Perhaps we should let go of that because the reality is not changing and it's not changing fast enough. There is still misery while many of us keep writing and meeting and calling and zooming. So most of all also criticizing science ourselves, the way we govern, the way we communicate, the way we get together and the way we, we keep away from true action. Perhaps the systems and the gears that worked for so long between all the various parties and interests in society started slipping. They don't fit together anymore. They cannot master this magnificent challenge the way we construed our society. So the gears are slipping and by continuously discussing the misery of sustainable development, we are cluttering the landscape. We are making it even more difficult. And there are interest groups. Uh, sustainable development is commercialized. There are so many conferences, new products, so much blah, blah. So many politicians stepping up front, the whole scheme becomes even more difficult. So I sincerely question if we can handle the jumble and humble sustainable development became. Uh, and highlighting people, planet, profit, let us realize that is a, it is of course nonsense to talk about three schemes to balance. People and profit are the same and planet is not at the table, has no voice. So we can discuss this endlessly, but it will not entangle the jumble. And sustainable development goals I don't wish to offend anybody or take away hope. It's a bit of everything, of course. It's still people, planet, profit. We're still discussing economy at, as if it's something else than society. And still earth has no voice. So for 50 years now, we're lagging behind while population grows, while we consume ever more, while carbon dioxide fills our air even faster. Even Corona couldn't stop the growth in carbon dioxide. That's very worrying. Then do SDGs, which is, I'm afraid, the most popular thing to discuss these days, do they offer guidance? I don't think so. They are, of course, each one of them alarm bells. Everything is important that's in, but it's a bit of everything. There is no line in it. There is no strategy. And my urgent request is to come forth with the global strategy, with a plan of action, with activities. It's not just about everybody, all of us doing something in their homes. It's about cohesion. It's about the force of massive effect that we have lingering. And we're not using that force to make a difference. So we're still looking at sustainable development at as if it is utterly complex. And I challenge that notion. If we look at the SDGs, of course, we don't want poverty. We, we, don't, we, we don't want people to be hungry. We don't want wars. There is no discussion. They are superfluous. We shouldn't have the need to underline these most obvious things we can all care about. We should all care about. Of course, we need good health. Of course, we need peace. 
So still open doors. And to achieve that, we need drinking water. We need energy, obviously. So when we dig down deeper in the SDGs, what, what can we do? Four and eight tell us something what we can do. There should be something with economy. There should be something with learning and education. But if we look closer, we still reason and discuss in terms of growth, and which is utter nonsense. While we are devouring this earth, growth should be written in red and black. Still an illusion that we cling on to since Brundtland. And quality education, whatever that may be, the SDGs only bring forth partnerships. It's always this dream, let's get together, do it together. And like even Greta said, it, it's, it's a lot of blah, blah, my dear people. So who will lead and act? The SDGs, as, as ever more scientists and politicians and entrepreneurs acknowledge, do present us with a pro-growth medal model, as if there will be always enough, as if there will be a second earth. And if we keep talking and putting these nice colored blocks behind our LinkedIn accounts and on Facebook and our posters, nothing will actually happen because we are not looking at number 12, which is more crucial. And that is what I underlined today. We are keeping away from the discussion about sustainable consumption and production. And of course, we talk about climate change. It is the one that tells us, hurry up. We don't have much time to, to, to waste anymore. But we keep lingering around this sustainable consumption and production, which is there for 50 years. So we're still distracted. What I proposed already many years ago is that we should take a heart, sit together, get together, and talk about Earth first, about ecology. What do we want to save? How many trees? How many deserts do we accept? What do we do with the oceans? And then when we sit together, do this with young people. As I said, we already lost two generations. Make youngsters more wise. They are the future. All this thinking in complex notions that the future is complex and uncertain. Well, actually it is not. The future is amongst us. Youth no longer has future, they are. And we're still, up until today, forgetting the essence of this absolute truth. The future is already in our midst. So if we learn for water, energy, construction, food and health in a continuous way, yeah, I see opportunity to have a next gen, not make the mistake we all made. Yeah. They can learn and understand what Earth is, what well-being truly means and in which degree we can accept welfare as an overshoot, as an excess. Of course, today schools are criticized. My plea would be stop criticizing and shouting around about schools, primary up to university. They are trampled on now. Teachers are pressured and SD is put upon them. My mission is to go to transdisciplinary education, to study all these future divining themes together cross-cultural, cross-nations, cross-borders, and to do that as humanity without oversizing differences. So study earth, fresh water, vapor, if, if, if it regards water. Let's talk about well-being. How many tons, millions of tons of water do we need for hygiene, for drinking? And how much of what remains do we wish to put in our sodas and in our swimming pools? That is the essence we need to make and get to decisions. If we go on a joint learning pathway, young all together, cross-border, across this world, our learning will become more meaningful. It will be about something. We can do this together. We don't need to politicize, discuss, and conference any longer. It's about learning and understanding. And we should dare to discuss UNESCO's proposition now to go to a whole school approach which is utter nonsense. We will again have institutes talking to institutions and meeting and gathering again. We need to go through a whole human, a whole student approach of learning and understanding how we wish to live, with whom, when, and to what degree we wish to consume. The only possibility to do so is to, learn, to 
cross our learning pathways and the way we build values and hope, the way we, we seek to understand decisions we really have to make. So we have to get together on local scales where we can see and smell, meet each other in a most diverse scheme. And these local spheres, of course, we can connect them with present day communication technology. We can even fly as far as I'm concerned. So we can get together and make this world a learning space. We just connect it and where our decisions about using and devouring the earth will become joint decisions. Perhaps we want to ruin it, but let's decide on that together if we want to. It's an option. It's better than doing nothing and let it all happen. But I'm still hopeful that a learning planet, interconnected people will learn to treasure, respect and understand each other. And that is the absolute base we have to go through. We have to discuss if we will any longer accept this nonsense of shipping goods around the world. Do we need a new computer 48 hours after we ordered it? What a nonsense. Do we need to ship around cars and medical supplies around the world? It's actually quite ridiculous. And it is perhaps even more ridiculous to still believe that industry is the bad guy in the room. We all are industry. We are the consumers. We decide what to do. Many of us work in industry. And we need the knowledge in there. We need the power, the influence. We need to crack logistical change. That's what I meant with people, planet, profit. People and profit are the same. So it makes no sense to sit in separate rooms and shout at each other. Go back to this 12th, this responsible consumption and production. As I said, it's about deciding how much of ecology we want to save. Simply in acres, number of trees, a number of lakes and roads through which we want to construct on it. We have to decide what well-being is. Is well-being a cup of water and a handful of rice for everybody? Don't think so. And do we have to accept welfare as 12 hamburgers a day, hours of gaming and TVs, lots of food for various countries and two less for others? So this is hugely difficult, I admit, but we have to get together and make a decision. Where do we use our scarce resources? For whom? When? Under what circumstances? To give you some very simple examples, there was in a factory a few weeks ago, German factory, which, which produces 25% of all the perfume bottles in the world. They fully thrive on natural gas. If natural gas goes down, the factory is closed. But then look what they make. They are beautiful, beautiful products, of course. But do we need perfume bottles, ladies and gentlemen? Do we need to ship them around the world and spend precious natural gas on it? Perhaps a silly example, but this is the essence. Is it a need or no? Do we need to game on average in the Netherlands one and a half to two hours a day? Watch TV for four hours? Use pesticides eh, to produce more hamburgers? So uh, we are in a welfare state, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, which is nearly ridiculous. We're fooling ourselves. And the whole world, of course, is fooling itself with fashion, that we need four types of new clothing every year. What a nonsense. So I think these decisions might sound simple, but of course they mean something. It has to we have to realize that once we start deciding, for example, to produce locally, to do less shipping and to cut down logistics that make up 25% of our production costs. If we do so, it, it will invoke change, quite dramatic change. But that is the learning and that is the education lesson we have to confront ourselves with. Because we will increase in numbers and these numbers, like a virus, and apologize for using that term, it still feels like humanity is a virus eating this world. And no program and no cuddly pictures and nice projects of putting solar cells on a school's rooftop will end that. We are diverse and rich and we can get together and learn together and there is a strategy. If we can only accept a joint leadership, 
perhaps in social terms, that's the most magnificent challenge we have. Many of us are used to hierarchical positions. The woman or the man on the top knows it all. I think that's very obsolete. Those times have disappeared. Many now think, let, let, let Elon Musk lead by example. Let somebody call the shots. Don't think we should do that for you. We need to be very careful who is calling the shots. If the footsteps already in the soil are true, if people are worthwhile following, do we then need more thought leadership? It's nice, of course, right? we need philosophers, we need scientists, we need politicians, we need artists, we need to exchange thoughts. But if it's a jumble humble, if it's a cacophony of thoughts, right? it will numb us, it will paralyze our movements. So also in thought leadership, we need to achieve some kind of mission, vision, consensus. Perhaps and then finalizing my presentation for today, we should realize what distributed leadership can mean to us. It will require connections, authentic insight, tuning of messages. Perhaps there can be many, many individual leaders in their own local communities, but then these leaders will need a kind of harmony. So the music in the background and the complex orchestra we make that music with uh, requires some music. There needs to be some harmony, some tone of voice. Uh, then we can lead in regions. Then we can share vision and mission and decide if we need the perfume bottles, decide when we need Russian gas or not at all anymore. I think we can still do that. We can still be this learning global encompassing human sphere that lives in balance with Earth. Absolutely, but then we have to let go of all the programs, restrictions, and old-fashioned and obsolete governance structures we, we enforced upon ourselves. So there is a learning planet, and that would be my plea and underline a double today. We need to open up to each other and take responsibility in formulating our own opinions, our own truths, and discuss them, discuss our values, decide if well-being is a cup of water and a handful of rice today and say to each other no that is not and that on the other hand gaming and fashion and eight hamburgers for a cheap price is utter nonsense and we cannot afford that nonsense anymore so let's get together and dig down deeper and absolutely proceed with the initiative that this great Balio university presented us again today let's learn together thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Yusen. We will now proceed to the third presentation by Mr. Ku Un. Um, doc, Mr. Ku, okay. are you now? Yeah, I thought you're on mute. Thank you, sir. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And I always feel very honored to have uh, followed uh, Dr. Renuka and Dr. Josh Eason, uh, always in this um, six-part presentation, because Dr. Renuka always presents the scientific overview, which presents the um, state of play today where the... Um, Sorry, I've got to bring my slide right to the front. I've been... And, and, and Dr. Yusen, Josh Yusen, has always um, presented uh, very, uh, in a way, idealistic, but always critical view of the current situation. Um, in a way that questions our very understanding of what uh, sustainability is, the state of play, and realistically looking at where we are. And as always, I have uh, always presented uh, from the viewpoint of business. And uh, from the viewpoint of business, today's topic, leading sustainable transformation, I always feel that um, at the end of the day, the crucial question is whether we have the will uh, to do it. 
whether, whether this is the future we all collectively want and whether this is the goal that we all collectively set for ourselves. There's a lot of um, discussion in business. There's a lot of talk in business. There's a lot of uh, declarations in business. Uh, the question remains, how far do they want to go? And I will recap uh, some of my slides from previous presentations to highlight uh, these issues. And then to maybe end with the question of uh, the fundamental conflict that businesses has to face. And then we can go into a discussion of whether that conflict can be resolved. And uh, that might lead us to a better understanding of number one, whether we have the will to, to achieve what we want to do. And if we have the will, what is the most efficient pathway that we can uh, adopt? I have presented this slide, uh, I think in the very first uh, session. And I always like this slide because this is the framework of the current discussion in the world today. Uh, from uh, you have uh, profit maximization to carbon offsets, ecosystem services, corporate social responsibility, ESG or environmental social governance. These are all what you call that the usual terms that's a lot that's being used today. And of course, SDGs, which uh, Josh has mentioned. And then the next best, the next to that is the voluntary sustainability standards or certification systems, which I've worked on in the past and which has afforded me the understanding of the role of business, the role of multi-stakeholder participants in this whole process of uh, trying to achieve a more sustainable world. They are exactly that, attempts to try to achieve a more sustainable world. But from where I come from, uh, companies which today are the bastions, stubborn bastions of bad behavior. They refuse to change in the face of so much uh, evidence. <clears throat> Given the slightest excuse, they prefer to go for fossil fuel <coughs> because of its lowest cost. And the political leaders do not want to make the stark choice because it would result in a recession <coughs> or inflation and they will lose their hold on power. So you have that fundamental problem uh, at that level. <clears throat> and the question becomes whether uh, at all levels, uh, from politics in terms of government, from corporate in terms of people, uh, businesses, and from civil society, whether we are willing to adopt uh, green ecocentric business values. So that's the first question and the first trend, the first conflict. The second is this unyielding, unabated trend towards urbanization that has happened over the last 5,500 years. You want to telescope it, no matter how, by the year 2050, we are going to have 70% of the world's population living in urban centers. And the total impact of urbanization on the environment is undeniable. <clears throat> we have totally distorted the natural planetary metabolism subjugated the rural metabolism. And I call the term metabolism a process description of what biodiversity is, what the natural system is. Our earth living system is, is it should be in balance, but we humans, the anthropogenic influence on this planet has distorted that metabolism to the extent that urban metabolism today is in no way coping with the poisons, with the waste with the excesses that has actually um, inundated the planet and our lifestyle. So that's the other thing that we have not come to terms with. And we are trying to capture this, of course, in many uh, uh, various ways of concepts. One is the circular economy model, which I've presented before on. And the other is the concept of urban metabolism, which I would offer as a more holistic view towards managing the Earth's economic, um, infrastructural, and social system. Uh, now, these are all mechanisms that we could uh, design and we could try to implement. The question is uh, whether they will work, whether they are the correct at, uh, device at the correct level, and whether they will be properly implemented. But we must frame the problem at a high enough level 
so that uh, we can achieve at least the solutions that will have resultant impact. The next area that I want to consider, and I've alluded this to, I think, session three or four, is the great wealth and income inequality in the world. Central to any discussion on sustainability is this issue of inequality because while we don't address it, it is the few who controls the production processes uh, in globalized supply chains. And this has all resulted from a deregulated global framework. Uh, we have imposed very limited choices to the whole of humanity. And this system is fundamentally, fundamentally flawed because this value system uh, does not take into account the um, priorities of the planet nor people. On the other hand, if we have a green ethos, which is ecocentric and earth-centric, and a value system that um, looks at the, uh, the, the, the welfare of everybody on earth, we would have one model, we could have a model that could work for a wider and better distribution of choices for humanity at large. But this falls into the realm of political ideology, the way uh, we operate a business, and the, various, the, the notion of a business model itself, how a business runs its uh, corporation. And this is actually at the very heart of the whole issue. So we have actually uh, at various levels of business at the notion of uh, developing a green ethos, uh, a movement that we hope we can actually popularize, uh, where we can look at these very issues uh, including global equity, including, sorry, including the issues of uh, urban metabolism, uh, including how to achieve sustainable innovation. Of course, ensuring that there is a very minimum of sustainable compliance. And of course, uh, how to create this ethos shift into an ecocentric leadership. And how do you actually uh, in, encourage the whole of society to have a sufficiency lifestyle? where consumption is limited to what you need, uh, but not what you want, which could be excessive. And so at the heart of green business leadership, which is still very rare and not easily found today, the notion of eco-sentience, where you have that sensibility that all life on earth are interrelated, and that we need the all of earth's resources to support life. If you have a business leader with this mindset, not one who wants to go off to Mars at the very first opportunity or develop that notion and, this, and leave this planet to its uh, demise. Uh, we need to have a leader who can actually say that, uh, yeah, we can actually develop a business model, a development model that doesn't need 1.7 Earths today to sustain uh, all our wants, but that we can have everything on Earth. One Earth is enough to even fulfill even maybe twice the population that we have today. So this is missing at the moment. And this is where we have to look uh, at. Looking at uh, how we do business in terms of the system boundary, where we need to look at including society and the planet to attribute a true return to all stakeholders, designing new models that could be earth and environment, environmentally centric. Such reconfiguration is difficult to conceive. But we can and we hope to identify such companies if they are in our midst and bring them up to the fore as models and examples with which we can uh, derive inspiration from and a practical way of uh, working with them. Um, I know we can point to all the excesses the companies do now because they need to cater to the wants of consumers who want all these things. But if we can have new business models that uh, have uh, recyclable perfume bottles, for example, <laughs> to follow the line of uh, yours, we don't need to have so much energy, therefore, to uh, create such wasteful production processes. But all more important is how do we create these pathways for the ethos shift to take place? Uh, this would have to come with transformation of uh, society, businesses themselves, maybe educational institutions towards the curriculums and towards what they 
uh, learn in the very first place in the formative years to move uh, the people, the leaders, the business leaders and companies along the path to greener values, to earth centricity. And of course, to change customer mindset so that a more holistic perspective is uh, derived. The last session, five, we covered ESG standards and practices. As you know, and I think in the business schools today, especially with the business schools in Baulig and other universities, we have a lot of discussion about ESGs. And I want to point out the latest developments here as a dramatic uh, example of how this uh, conflict uh, is a, uh, arises. We so you know that CSR, which has been formulated many years ago, wants to hold companies accountable for their role as a corporate citizen. But increasingly recently, uh, ESG criteria, environmental social governance criteria have emerged. And the ESG criteria can be qualitative, can be quantitative, but they basically try to have a metric whereby investors can see how well uh, their investments in the companies can uh, hold out. That's a recent article by Duncan and Pola uh, of the University of Lancaster, the Pentland Center for Sustainable Business, where uh, they differentiate between financial materiality and economic, environmental and social materiality. Materiality here is defined as uh, what is significant, what is important. And this has been referred to by the one of the standards. And when we look at this, we are looking at uh, what matters to a corporation. Uh, basically, it's financial materiality. And what matters to consumers, civil society, and employers, maybe as a whole, we look at environmental and social materiality. So to just illustrate, uh, carbon pricing, uh, achieving net zero, is a goal today that has been often touted since Edinburgh, or at least the years since Edinburgh, which is basically carbon neutrality. And the whole idea of net zero is to make sure that the emissions that we make into the uh, atmosphere uh, is balanced by the absorption by the year 2050 so that the whole world is carbon neutral or we achieve a net, net zero. But uh, to do that, uh, we have the financial impact on companies. If you have a carbon pricing, which is basically a tax on carbon, and this is going to impact their financial uh, performance. On the other hand, if you have a net zero plan, you are basically also talking about environmental and social materiality, which is basically a, a, a consideration that look at the world outside in. And this takes us to this diagram, ESG versus sustainability. Sustainability is basically uh, inside out. Remember my earlier chart about ecocentricity, where we focus on the earth and social system. So that's taken as the priority where uh, sustainability is concerned. But when we talk about ESG, it's an outside-in approach where enterprise value is uh, taken as the primary source. And this fundamental conflict is going to take place over the next 10, 15 years. And while we talk about this, uh, the goals of uh, achieving net zero from 2025 to 2030 are being imposed on us. So the question becomes whether corporations will have the will, the willpower to look at it from inside out we're having ecocentric values, or they will they look at it from outside in? Uh, basically, anything to do with the environment and society is something that they only look upon as impacting their balance sheet. So, uh, I'll leave with two last slides, which is basically the question of this uh, session leading to sustainable transformation. So, how do we achieve it? I asked and I led with do we have the will to do it? Uh, and if the will, is to make stark choices between financial materiality and, and environmental and social materiality. Uh, who is going to make these choices? Uh, if you leave it to government leaders, political leaders, and they have to look at the welfare of their citizens and even corporations so that economic growth is always achieved, uh, I, I'm afraid the decision will never be made in favor of uh, the earth nor the environment. And we have, of course, as uh, Josh mentioned, the United Nations as an institution, they have declared the SDGs. But um, while that is well and good, we have all 190 over countries agreeing to the SDGs. 
the real there is a power structure outside the UN, and you know that the UN is paralyzed in many ways if they do not want to move on anything, and they can declare that the SDGs are the goal that they want to lead the whole world on, and everybody has to find themselves activities or some part that they can play in achieving the SDGs. But is it all just uh, speech and discussion and talk, but no action really in place? Or is it something that they need to actually achieve? The WWF, for example, has come up with some middle of the road uh, role for companies to play. Do this, do that, account and disclose set climate targets and all that. But will, will, will it make an impact? Will the needle be moved? So this is what I would like to leave you with. How do we achieve, achieve this ethos shift? What are the pathways and strategies ahead? And all these influencing factors to navigate. So with that, I'd like to uh, close and thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to, to present during these six sessions that I hope that we have raised the most important points and I hope that we can uh, spin off to even better and more uh, incisive uh, uh, explorations and discussions to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ko. Excellent presentation. Can you go to your second last slide? Perfect. Thank you very much. And you spoke about choices. And of course, Joss also spoke about choices. That, and I also think we need to make choices. And so I would like our uh, audience to tell what is making choices and which choices we need to make, how we can make this. And I, let us have the discussion starting from choices. Please feel free to take the mic and speak. Mm -hmm. All right, I think Dr. Thakor is encouraging or enjoining anyone to specify or probably think of the choices that they have to do to make for it to be able to make these projects or make the ideas that we have uh, possible or achievable. Okay. And I think while our participants are mulling over their ideas, let me first let me first thank the three presenters. Thank you to the members of the delivery team, Dr. Renuka, Thakor, Dr. Joss Yusen, Mr. Kuhok Un, for such a comprehensive and insightful discussion. Uh, let's give them our virtual claps. So we have surely learned a lot. You know, your discussions may have sparked some questions, but aside from the from the question asked by Dr. Takor earlier, you might have other questions from the presentation. So the virtual floor is ready as well for your question or for the open forum. So you may want to use the chat box for your questions or you may want to unmute yourself and identify yourself and ask your questions directly to our panel. So well, let me check on the chat box if there are questions. So. Okay, so none yet. I think they are still preparing their questions if there are any. But before that, let me probably give a quick recap or probably highlight some of the things that were presented. So I think the theme among the three presentation really is the collective effort of all in taking the leadership to do proactive actions in attaining sustainable future. So the year is 2025 and it's very near. So we brought this pressure to ourselves because as mentioned, as mentioned this is mostly brought by man-made activities and it relies also on us individuals to take proactive actions and to have collective efforts to achieve such. Okay, It is not enough just to talk about it, but really to take action and to procure projects that are visible, functional, and something that we call, we could hold on to. That, that is something also sustainable, right? <laughs> right, dear presenter? So, yeah, so I think, uh, okay, so, yes, yeah, so, I'm checking the chat box if there are any questions. Perhaps some of you, okay. There are some 
one who's raising his hand. Okay, may I, I call in Mr. Kelkar? I hope I pronounce your name right. I think he has some questions yes. or probably some comments. Go ahead, sir. This is about uh, Dr. Nikotako's uh, comments on uh, choices. Uh, I think uh, the choices that you should make is not about uh, individual choices, but about the system itself. That is the choice I would make. All right. So it's the system itself. So probably we've become, again, active participants in the system that we are in. Now, so if we are in the academe, so we would be very precise on our actions, probably including this in our curriculum. Let us uh, also not also in school, as mentioned by the presenters, we are always part of a certain group, may it be a family, and probably we could yes. bring into the table what we have learned here. Let's include it in our breakfast table, the, the, the discussion of such. Okay, All right. So I think that's a very good idea, Mr. Kalkar. Okay, uh, thank you, Ashish. Thank you. You have mentioned that we will make a choices of the system, but but system are established and therefore we want to change the whole system you are saying. However, we are part of the system and therefore we need to make choices. Now, just as Joss mentioned here, that do we want to buy perfumes? Yes, people are business, people are going to make them because they find economic profits out of it, and there are people who are buying it. So we need to make the choice whether we want to buy it or not. What we want to buy, natural perfume, which is local and uh, which, which can be easily available, or we want to buy a perfume which has been uh, imported, branded, and so on, which uses high level of energy. So that is our choice and how we can compel these businesses to move their uh, manufacturing or move their motives, move their business uh, uh, strategy, uh, business uh, uh, competitiveness, how we, how we can do that. So for example, this business itself moves to the renewable energy, totally renewable energy which means they are not using gas now. Then will your choice change? Still there is a lack of, our, of logistic because bringing that from distant country would involve use of energy. Now they might say that we are sending that uh, perfume bottles through steamer or using a low, low energy transport system. Because there is again a new technology coming up, which is going to use only magnets to transform uh, goods and possibly it is going to be net zero transformation then. But we don't have that technology yet. So these are the systemic problems. So thank you for raising that. Mm -hmm. And we want to change the systems, like how we transport, how we manufacture food, how we manufacture any goods and how people choose that. And therefore your socio-technical systems are very much in place. Technology provides you something and there are the user's choices influence that technology. Logic. And it is give and take thing. And therefore, of course, our choices are going to change the system and system is going to provide us some solutions. But here again, we have our choices to change the system. And therefore, we should take leadership to change. I will uh, invite Joss and uh, Hope to step in here. Yes. Yeah, thank if, you. Yeah, if I just may... Uh... Compliment what you said, Miluka, and uh, coming back to Ashish briefly, I think Ashish very well understood that the choices we have to make 
are more profound, more deep. So the 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 the, the example of the perfume bubbles I right, presented to discuss the urgency of bubbles to begin with, not how to transport them, but question: Do we need perfume? Do we need to put them in bubbles? And do we need to ship these bubbles around the globe? Perhaps we can use local or regional attributes, a competence we have in nature eh, to make wonderful perfumes in France and in Manila and in Peru. Eh? So it sounds old fashioned, eh? but uh, waiting for new technology, it gives us this illusion that presents us with the illusion that we can still proceed on this unsustainable pathway. So my concern is a bit more profound and a bit, perhaps a bit more ugly. Eh? I would uh, strongly uh, empathize, for example, with local clothing production. We don't need fashion from Milan or, or Los Angeles. So, so my remarks are, are profoundly more basic and I want to challenge. So, so it's, it's not seeking, seeking, let me say, uh, my own right in this, but at least we should learn and relearn what earth and well-being truly means because the need is extremely high. And technology can present as an illusion because we also have to realize technology makes things worse. We, we, we can applaud uh, Elon Musk just as an example, uh, that technology will progress us, take us to Mars. It also created the atom bomb. It also created fertilizers we do not need. In the Netherlands, we produce tomatoes for the whole of the world and strawberries. Realize what we're doing. We're using huge amounts of gas and pesticides and biotechnology to produce huge amounts of food that our body doesn't need and our neighbors don't need it. So after we face these most essential, existential questions, there may still be opportunities to share bottles around the world. I'm not saying we should all uh, lay down in a dark room and then shut up and turn, out, turn off the heater room, but we have to face existential questions, for otherwise Africa will never rise and the South will keep lagging behind compared with the North, or behind is just a relative notion, of course. So, rest my case for the moment, the, prof the questions to be raised and answered are more profound, we need more absolute knowledge, we need deeper insights in our own behavior, in our own idea of well-being. I'd like to jump in, Ashish, uh, with your question of uh, having to change the system. It's in fact a very deep question because um, we, we have to define ourselves. What, what kind of system are we operating under now? Um, do we define, I mean, um, there's so many terms and uh, terminologies to describe our predominant system of, uh, of, 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 of governance, of uh, economic models on the earth right now. And, and there are many variations around. Uh, some say they are better than the other, but everyone has a drawback somewhat or other. But the, the predominant system that has so far emerged on this earth is a capitalistic model. And the capitalistic model that has uh, seen over 500 years the creation of uh, artificial persons in the form of corporations, uh, uh, property, can, the, the, the assets and the values can be transferred from uh, in an in a immortal fashion down the line. So you have 100-year-old corporations, 200-year-old corporations, but then all these also uh, become obsolete and they'll have new technologies and you have uh, you can survive the founder, so to speak. Uh, you can bet that when Elon Musk leaves this planet, uh, Tesla will still be around, SpaceX will still be around, maybe Twitter will still be around. But then the question becomes, uh, who owns these corporations after these founders have taken them over? Uh, are they the new feudal lords of this planet, whereby instead of uh, national borders, they actually go into international, multinational presences and behave 
uh, no different from the feudal lords. It's a new feudalism of the world today. And because of that, nation states become subservient to this global infrastructure of political, economic, uh, uh, equ uh, equity, ownership. So I'm trying to grapple with the right terminology for this because uh, one side will say they are for capitalism, another side will say they are for communism, another side will say they are for socialism, and it confuses everybody because everybody brings in their own own values and their own biases, and they, we have a big argument, and the argument never ends. <laughs> but what we see clearly and nakedly is that there is a political structure at play here, which is not what you see in the institutions. And it's nakedly at play. And this political structure is what drives the world. They dictate the decisions that are made. Uh, and I'm not going to be afraid to say it, it's oil and gas uh, that drives the world today. And whichever power structure uh, that uh, requires, that, that, that depends on it now, uh, wants to see this persist as much as possible. And it relates back to imperialism. Certain countries still see themselves as imperial. Uh, they collect these assets and they use these assets. Uh, oil and gas is basically for the funding and the money of it. But then with that, they buy all the other technologies and the means to that. So uh, in a political economic framework, uh, we have to investigate why this is so and how this has uh, persisted. Uh, I, I made this reference the other day, and this is beyond before the world of oil and gas. Um, there was a scene in the movie um, Elizabeth, uh, which was directed by an Indian director. And Prince Philip was inspecting this armada before the armada sailed forth to uh, conquer England. And the director of the movie was very clever to put in the scene of all the depleted uh, oak forests in Spain at that time. I don't think there are any more oak forests in Spain. So for the... Um, for, for, for whatever is motivating uh, Prince Philip, I mean, it was the Vatican and all that. I'm not getting into the religious part of this, but he wanted to conquer England and he depleted all the oak forests of Spain. Now, that's the first deforestation of the European continent taking place, right? And this is before oil and gas, but it's all about power. And it's all about power systems. And uh, our friend Prince Philip II had his beard singed, of course, by the English. <laughs> and then you know the rest of his days, what it is today. And five years later, we are seeing almost the same thing. So to solve, uh, to change the system is easier said than done. Uh, so where does the change come from? Uh, is it more science? Is it education? Is it uh, revamping business? Is it uh, creating systems that uh, allow for more socialization of profit, so that uh, the whole of the world can benefit from all the wealth creation and not just a few. As I mentioned before, the capitalist system is very good at creating wealth, but very poor at distributing it. And what mechanism can we have in place that can achieve both so that, the, the reason for distributing wealth is that so that everybody can make sustainable choices. The 90% of the world who are in a low income group cannot make the sustainable choices because they are not afforded given those choices. The choices given to them today are not sustainable and they are dictated by a group of people who are intent and bent on making the most money out of the planet and the people of this earth. <laughs> it's as simple as that. So how do we devise a system, evolve a system, emerge a system? If we're not going to have a revolution that's violent, uh, we don't believe in violent processes, we want an educated, progressive emergent system. And we don't have time because the climate, uh, climate people say, Dr. Rinika will say, we have only until 2030 or 2050 at the very least. And we, we don't have the luxury of time to effect the change in the system overall. And if we try to do it through education, it uh, again takes too much time. Then, of course, I think at the end of the day, it has to uh, fall back upon people like us to be conscious of what the exact problem is and how we might want to deal with it. And it is just not about the system itself. It is about the choices that Dr. Renuka uh, talked about. So that is, I think, the most important word. Yeah. And, and to... We don't have a choice. 
very very short quick no, one. We, we have a choice every time we live because in this day we don't need to be electing a government every five years we can actually um, be conscious about uh, influencing decisions every moment of the day uh, in the political sphere in the corporate sphere and in the communal commun community sphere and in those in that sense yes we can make choices every day but these choices need to uh, be of impact we can even influence political situations uh, with impact we don't need to wait for elections to do that. Yes, I agree with you. We can do it now. We don't have uh, at every level, and we can do it consciously. All right. So thank you, everyone who participated on that exchange. But my takeaway from that wonderful exchanges is that the re the real challenge really is getting all sectors on board, school, industry, and everyone, and us being part of the system individually. So we could start in the pro and the challenge is to have our individual effort resonate with others, not to have a common goal. And I remember in the presentation that sustainability is not complex. So let us put glamour on the simplicity of attaining it. Right. All right. So I think there are no questions, but there are some comments also regarding the choices. Uh, Mr. Pradhan. Would you like to share your thoughts or would you like me to read straight from the chat box what you have encoded? Is Mr. Pradhan here? Yeah. Are you able to hear? Yes, sir. Go ahead. So actually, I really enjoyed the three presentation. And the crux what I found is sustainability is like, you know, we need to change our choices and most importantly, our behavior. Mm -hmm. As of now, like, you know, we humans are extracting resources, but we seldom give a thought of like, you know, replenishment of resources. And the way linear economy, you know, extract, use, and throw. But again, it has created a junk. And then we understood that, you know, we need to take care of this part also. So in a planet where we have limited resources and limited choice, choices, we need to change our behavior. And we need to have, a, a, you know, totalitarian holistic attitude towards looking at things. I think sustainability is not just about, like, you know, it's not just every, everybody's concern is this, but everybody needs to be collective in this action. And most importantly, one needs to be sensitized. Like we talked about, like, no, no, the corporations, the extraction, and the economy is mostly focused on GDP. But we are forgetting that we are surviving on this planet based on the natural resources and the, the earth which we, it, it gives us. So if we are not going to conserve it, we are not going to actually live a life more. And we will not leave a life to the future generation. So it's important that this, this generation, like this, this decade of action, we need to have more, more proactive and more aggressive attitude towards you know, changing these choices. So with that, I, I would say that this is what I, I, I my key takeaways from this session, Zara. And I really enjoyed like you know the Dr. Hussein's uh, perspective, like you know, the people and planet, you know, sorry, profit and people are the one and the same. So we need to actually, you know. Uh, understand this connect like you know how how people you know utilize this planet and how they are able to rejuvenate this planet through their constructive actions we talked about negative aspects but let's 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 discuss more about like you know positivity what we can do at our level that's it thank you yes sir uh, thank you dr pradhan so we should not wait to be asked what to do and we will we should have the initiative to start action okay so let us hear from our very own here the in Bali university the, the head of the technical team of this particular endeavor may we hear from miss reina flor castro on her thoughts <laughs> madam christelle so hi everybody i hope you enjoyed the six session so thank you for being with us and again in this quest for sustainability when it comes to choices, I can really admit that we really have to act. So we all know that action speaks louder than words. And I definitely agree with Dr. Joss that we have to consume only what we need and not what we want. To, of course, lessen the wasteful consumption. So Dr. Joss, after your talk, I only bought one gene. Promise. <laughs> okay. It, it may be simple. It may be simple, but or a little, but it has a big impact. So really, it's our behavior, it's our call to action because if we will not act now, there will be no future at all for our future generation. And we only have one Earth, really, one Earth. So we uh -huh. shouldn't re kill it. Okay. okay. So let, let us uh, make the Earth live. 
All right. <laughs> thank so, you so much. Yes, thank you, Ms. Reina Flor Castro. So indeed, let us be a re- not only a responsible consumer, but a critical and analytical consumer. Going back to the talk about perfume. Okay, so... Uh, We do not we do not need 20 pairs of shoes if we we just need to report to work three times a week. So yeah, so uh, it would not only save us from from spending but also saving the earth. Okay, so all right. So I think there are no more questions. So uh, again, thank you very much to the delivery team and who participated in the open forum. So once again, so again, thank you, thank you so much for generously commenting and participating in the exchanges. And again, let's give them a warm virtual our virtual claps. So may I now request your cooperation in evaluating our webinar. Kindly check the chat box for the evaluation Hi. link. Hello. Yes, yes Steph. Good morning, Dr. Dad, I wanted to just right. have that three questions uh, and let us see what people say. I will share and, the slide. All right. And uh, the question, oh yeah. All right, Dr. Renukar, yes, you may now again share your screen. Yeah. So which country will lead the global narrative on sustainability? You can write your answers in the chat. All right. <laughs> Go Philippines. <laughs> it suddenly sparked a question for me. Can a third world country lead a global narrative of sustainability? <laughs> That's like... <laughs> uh, all right, all nations. <laughs> All right. Okay. So. All right. Okay. So you could just check on the chat box for the insights of our participants. Okay. So all nation. Okay. So. Okay. Next question. Which industry will play a critical role in taking us forward rapidly? Okay, and the third question is, will we achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030? I will stop sharing. And before I go to the answers, I would like to share one comment because I think uh, the comment has come from, uh, let me just check. Okay, the comment has come from Clarissa Floresca, but it has come directly to me. Probably uh, she must have, or he must have made a mistake. Uh, Clarissa, are you here? Would you like to, to uh, speak your comment? Uh, 
Dr. Takore, I actually sent it to you because you were the one asking for that question on choice. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking uh, it would be better that I give it directly okay. to you. All right. And uh, would you like to read or uh, just keep it okay. for me? Oh, okay, I can read it if you want. Uh, oh, yes, first and foremost, thanks. <laughs> uh, wait. I'm not sure if I can use my video, but anyway, I just read. Thanks to our first and foremost, thanks to the three very super practical lecturers and professors. So, as to the choice, because that's what uh, Dr. Takore was asking us, uh, a choice in something basic like eating healthy living, uh, like uh, eating healthy, living a healthy lifestyle to the basic choice of starting to plant vegetables and fruits using whatever is available, uh, either soil or using, as we know now, no, some hydroponics, uh, depending on the space one has and by empowering persons to think of what their expertise would be in helping their families and in the long run communities do as well. So nutrition education we know starts at a very, very early stage of life. And could it be the moms to educate them at first stage or the, I don't know if the moms are working, perhaps it's the one who would take care of the child. And then, so we need also to educate the ones who will take care of the children. if. They're not the moms, or perhaps we have to educate the moms as well. Uh, and then the older siblings, perhaps, the kindergarten teachers, the nutrition or anatomy physiology professors, integrating social responsibility with the scientific facts learned as basic as food. I think as we think of many people um, being in, on this earth and trying to consume a lot, uh, and we say leaving carbon footprints, but we know that human persons are intelligent persons as well. So we can, with our own responsibility and uh, edu being part of edu uh, edu the, edu the education industry to help no, other, others as well, other human persons, young or not so young, mature, no, to also uh, be able to help sustain Mother Earth by uh, starting to also maybe plant or take care of animals to be able to uh, really show that social responsibility you know, for one's own family, oneself and one's own family. Thank you, thank you very much. Just going uh, uh, before to the answers, uh, I would like to say that of course here, Jaws has presented a very critical view um, and Hook and uh, I probably have present, Hook has presented actually practical pathway forward. And I have presented a very optimistic and ambitious pathway, but my ambitions are not based on just, just out of blue, like uh, just having ambitions. They are based on realities. The state of art is changing. Actually, SDGs were made by 80 million people, which means that they that is what they want. Uh, it is, uh, sorry, not want, but that is what they need. And therefore, I think we all should uh, collectively work towards them even if we go a slightest way forward. They are the drivers. And if you choose any one driver, it will lead to many synergies. And so it is a segregate, and also it shows that our world is segregated on these uh, views and because of the segregated realities of the world, people. People are having their own context own reality and everyone should un try to understand their own reality and how to uplift that for sustainable transformation. And so each one has that responsibility. So I think I will close for that, uh, the discussion and let us go which country will lead the global narrative on sustainability. So the answers are 
and the main answer here is emerging that every nation, I think, am I correct in saying that? Uh, most yes. of them are saying all nations. Yes. Uh, but I would say, of course, everyone should lead. That is our aspiration that everyone should lead uh, on global sustainability leadership uh, narrative. But I think of what has happened and what I see from my side, from my personal viewpoint, that because EU is having the tremendous challenge of going towards net zero and so on, I think they are, uh, I'm not speaking of, of one country, but I think the whole region of EU, including UK, are leading on this uh, narrative, actually. I, I'm not uh, uh, telling about their progress and their achievements. I'm talking about the narrative and probably they are leading on this narrative at the moment. And that's why I think uh, Joss is also able to speak such critical voice Anna. because he is also a part of that narrative. Uh. And I welcome that. Secondly, which industry will play a catalyzing role in <laughs> taking us forward? And I think most of, like we get variety of answers here and everyone think that all, all uh, industries should play a cat catalyzing role. But what is common between all the industry is the energy use. And therefore I believe that clean energy, making clean energy space or energy, clean energy industry will be the will play the catalyzing role in taking us forward rapidly. So each and every sector or industry has to build in clean energy, and then only we will be able to move forward. And lastly, will we achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030? Generally, everyone is uh, not in uh, favor of like we will be achieving. Of course, it is a hard goal. We will not be achieving, but I am sure we will making some progress in understanding that, and that will be the start of our journey towards a rapid transformation towards uh, SDGs. And I will stop here now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Thakor. So, uh, so let us now again proceed with the evaluation of the activity in which you could see the link in the chat box. So please answer the evaluation before the end of the program. So to those who have questions on how you can get your electronic certificate, these certificates will be directly emailed to the participants. At this point, we will proceed with the awarding of certificates to our visiting fellows. May I call the Baliwagyu University President, Dr. Lagunda, for the virtual ceremonial giving of certificates. But I think Dr. Lagunda is having difficulty with her connection, so we will now proceed with the awarding the certificate the citation B Baliwag University University of College of Estate Management Global Sustainable Futures Network the Open Duca Project and Maastricht University in the Netherlands present the certificate of recognition to Mr. Ku Hok Un Dr. Joss Yusen and Dr. Renuka Thakor for their valuable presentation of the insightful lectures presented during the Shaping Sustainable Future Together series held every third Friday of the month from November 2021 to April 2022 via Zoom. Given this 29th day of April 2022 via Zoom meeting at Baliwag University, Baliwag Bulacan, Philippines. Signed by Dr. Renu Patakor, founder of Global Sustainable Futures Network, University College of Estate Management, United Kingdom, and Dr. Patricia Lagunda, president of Baliwag University, Philippines. So thank you all so much, Mr. Un, Dr. Yusen, and Dr. Tapor. Okay, the, okay, Mom Pat is here. She was able to connect. May, <laughs> Hello, Mom Pat. So we are now in the awarding of the certificates. 
So we shall now be awarding the certificates of participation and completion to the participants. Those who were able to attend some of the sessions will be given the certificate of participation and the certificate of completion will be awarded to those who were able to attend all six sessions. Let me read the certificate of participation, Baliwag University, University of College of Estate Management, Global Sustainable Futures Network, the OPEDUCA Project, and Maastricht University, the Netherlands, present the Certificate of Participation given to the participants for the active interest, support, and attendance to Shaping Sustainable Future Together series held every third Friday of the month from November 2021 to April 2022, given this 29th day of April 2022 via Zoom meeting at Baliwag University, Baliwag, Bulacan, Philippines. Signed by our delivery team, Mr. Kuhokon, the convener of Global Sustainability Summits and Dialogues, Global and ASEAN Green Chambers of Commerce, Dr. Joss Yusen, lecturer of Sustainable Development and Climate Change, Maastricht University, the Netherlands, Dr. Renuka Takor, founder of Global Sustainable Futures Network, and Dr. Patricia Lagunda, president of Baliwag University, Philippines. Here is the list of the participants who will be receiving the Certificate of Participation. Congratulations. For the Certificate of Completion, so again, it reads... Baliwag University, University College of Estate Management, Global Sustainable Futures Network, and the OPEDUCA Project and Massachusetts University, the Netherlands, present the Certificate of Completion to the completers for the active interest, support, and full attendance in all six sessions to Shaping Sustainable Future Together series held every third Friday of the month from November 21 to April 22 via Zoom. Given this day, this 29th day of April 2022 in Baliwag University, Baliwag, Bulacan. Signed again by the delivery team, Mr. Un, Dr. Yusen, Dr. Renuka, and Dr. Lagunda. So, congratulations to the completers. For those whose names are not on the list, you may coordinate with the SSFTS committee through the email that will be posted in the chat box. All right. So at this point, we shall also be awarding certificate of appreciation to those who made this series possible. Starting off with the moderators, the certificate says, Baliwag University, University College of Asset Management, Global Sustainability Futures Network, the OPEDUCA Project, and Maastricht University, the Netherlands, present the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Ramadan D.C. De Jesus, the moderator of the first session, Ms. Melanie G. Santos, the moderator of the third session, Dr. Alma G. Alma Jose, moderator of the fourth session, Dr. Hasmin Tayel, moderator of the second and fifth sessions, and yours truly, Crystal Consalan, your moderator for today. In grateful appreciation for their dedicated service as moderators during the Shaping Sustainable Future Together series held every third Friday of the month from November 2021 to April 2020. So this is also signed by the delivery team, Mr. On, Dr. Yusen, Dr. Takor, and Dr. Lagunda. Thank you, organizers, for this certificate. Okay. All right, so certainly the success, the success of the organization and rollout of this webinar series is because of the hard work and effort of the technical committee led by Reina Flor Castro. With this, Baliwag University, together with the University College of Essex Management, Global Sustainable Futures Network, the OPEDUCA Project, and Massachusetts University presents the Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Francia R. Santos, Mr. Reina Flor A. Castro, Ms. Jasmine Domingo, Mr. Archie Carlos U. Cruz, Mr. Alora Erica Salcedo, Ms. Micaela M. Victa, and Ms. Maripol Pozuelo in grateful appreciation for their dedicated service as members of the Technical Committee during the Shaping Sustainable Future Together series held every third Friday of the month from November 2021 to April 2022. So this is also signed by the delivery team and the president of Baliwag University. Thank you, thank you so much. 
to the technical team. Also, thank you once again to the lecturers, to the participants, moderators, and technical committee. Let us all continue to envision and work for a sustainable future. The topics covered in all six sessions surely have laid grounds that will spring interest and inspiration to be proactive builders of sustainable futures. We now come to the end of our webinar, inspired and motivated to come together for sustainable futures. So plus, just a reminder, we shall have our group picture taking in a while. Okay. For the formal closing of our event, let me give the virtual floor to Dr. Flordadisa A. Castro, Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of School of Graduate Studies of Baliwag University for her closing remarks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. In behalf of Baliwag University, we'd like to extend our appreciation to the attendees to the Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series, which were conducted from November 2021 to April 2022, every third Friday of the month. There were six topics that were discussed by our Baliwag University Visiting Fellows for Global Sustainability the delivery team of the Shaping Sustainable Futures Together series in partnership with Maastricht University, Netherlands, University College of Estate Management, and the Open Tuka Project. Allow me to again say thank you very much to Dr. Renuka Takore, Dr. Josh Yusen and Professor Ku Hok On for your expertise and comprehensive discussion on leading sustainable transformation. Certificates of recognition will be awarded to the members of the delivery team and the members of the technical committee of Baliwag University. To all of you, thank you for your participation and support in this project. We will also distribute certificates of participation and attendance to all the participants and attendees. Please wait for them in your email addresses. I am sure that all of you have gained knowledge and information gained from the six lectures on sustainable development goals. Please disseminate the information that you have acquired, that you have learned, and be leaders on your own capacity for us, for everyone to attain the sustainable development goals. Let us work together regardless of our discipline or areas of specialization. Let us share our resources together and let us respond collaboratively for a sustainable future for the next generation. True enough, we have our roles to play in the realization of the Sustainable Development Goals 2020 which when attained will provide us a better and a more sustainable future for all. By working together, we will be able to achieve the goals and we will be able to enjoy a better future in the years to come. Again, in closing, I would like all of us to become agents of sustainable future. Thank you very much. And as we say it here in the Baliwag University, let us be the best that we can be. Thank you. And I say good luck to everyone. Good day. Thank you, Dr. Castro. So may I now request everyone to kindly turn on your cameras for our last group picture taking. 
All right. So put on your best smile. So I think Miss Reina Florga Caso would take the picture. Yes. Right? Uh, right. Definitely. As the official <laughs> photographer of this session. Uh, hi, Dr. Pat and Dr. Oh, Dr. Orosa. <laughs> Okay, so everyone, again, this is the last session. So please bring out your beautiful smile. So your handsome faces and beautiful faces. Okay, so in the count of three, one, two, three. Uh, can you look at your camera's device? Uh, one, two, three, smile. Allow me to face it. So I'm in the first frame and uh, in the second frame. So again, let us uh, please open your cameras if you can. Okay, one, two, three, smile. Okay, for a while, another one. Sorry, uh, I pressed something. <laughs> okay, one, two, three, smile. Second frame. Okay, and that's it. So thank you so much. Back to you, Miss Crystal. Thank you again, Miss Reina Flor Castro. Thank you very much to everybody who are here. Thank you very much for your active engagement. Let's be challenged to expand our horizons on sustainable futures and live in a happy and healthy world. Again, I am Crystal Ponsalan from Baliwag University, Philippines. Thank you and stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm. Bye. <laughs> Bye and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank to you. Our visiting Thanks to all. It's been a thank pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Mukan. Bye bye. Dr. Joss. Bye. And Mr. Koo. Thank you, Dr. Franz. Dr. Pat. Thank Force you so team. much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rina, can you stop yes. sharing because I want to take a screenshot? Okay, uh, Mom Dana, can you please stop sharing? I will just I will stop the recording as well. Thank you.